<laughs> All right, so we left off talking about a compensated cam. However, after spending the day listening to orals, maybe we should start off with where we left off, started yesterday, with the fact that you can't shock somebody with a magnet. Man, oh man, oh man. So, if I have a rotating magnet. <laughs> And the pole shoes and the pole shoe extension. I have to make the same thing over here, which is the hard part. <laughs> right? Do I have a complete circuit? No. What's missing? Maybe all the people who've already passed this oral should just like look at the other people. Okay. So now I have the magnetic circuit, yes? Yeah. Okay. So, is there electricity flowing through this? Absolutely not. Of course. I mean, there's no electricity. What does flow through it? Magnetic lines of flux are flowing through it. And these magnetic lines of flux flow through it, and they also expand out and cut across the primary coil. Okay, well, enough of you seem to have it. The primary coil then gets induced current because the lines of flux Ooh. cut across it. <laughs> Inducing a voltage in the primary circuit. primary circuit. So how much voltage do I have now in the, in the magnetic circuit? Zero. Still none. When am I going to have voltage in the primary in the magnetic circuit? Zero. Never ever. Okay. Never. So we're not going to have voltage there. Stop it. So the key to that oral is how do you create voltage in the primary? How does the voltage get there? What? From the magnetic lines of flux cutting across the primary. Just like that. From the magnetic flux in the magnetic circuit cutting across it. And then collapsing and expanding and collapsing. So mostly it's the collapsing part. How do we get voltage a current in the secondary. Because the primary coil creates its own lines of flux. Primary coil creates its own magnetic lines of flux to go out to the secondary. I don't know, maybe if we thought about it a little bit different and said, okay, here's the coil core and we have the primary is wrapped around there, all these windings around there. But then we have the secondary all the way out here. Maybe if we said the lines of flux from the coil core, lines of flux, cut across the primary. Are they cutting across the secondary? No. All right, so I'm just making this up. So it's not enough to cut across the secondary, but we induce a voltage in the primary, and the primary then goes out across the <laughs> secondary. Would that work for you? Yeah. Okay. Then, then when I open the breaker points, breaker points, there we go, breaker points. When we open them up, then we collapse the field in the primary. primary. Collapses, and then we have voltage in the secondary. All right, Kevin, let's go back to that table. <laughs> All right. Do I understand right? All this is a compensated cam. Yeah. Sorry. Yes, yes, it is. What position is the magnet in right now? Neutral. So it means it's off. Okay, heard that today. So where are the magnetic lines of flux going? You can't go nowhere. They're there. Right there. Yep. It's it's called shorting out. It's technically shorted out. So all the lines of flux go right there. How many? Are, how much voltage is going through the core? 
It's not a trick question. It's zero. <laughs> okay. One day, one day we'll get through all of this. Well, you have a test tomorrow, so after, after that, it's not my problem. All right, so we were talking about, actually it is. We were talking about a compensated cam. And, yeah, look at that. See, I kind of did that. How do I, how do I make that stop? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so it's going to make me. So right here, this one here is connected to the master rod, and all these are articulating rods. Okay, so how many cylinders at one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight? It says nine cylinder radial going around, and it goes in kind of an ellipse. It's not a perfect circle because of the master rod, articulating rod arrangement. So. If I were to take these and we have what's uh, nine divided by 360, I don't know how my calculator was that come out to be, like 40, 40 some, 360 divided by nine. Is it 40? Uh, okay. Oh yeah, because nine times four is 36. Thank you. Okay. So if I were to look at that, and say, okay, and, and the way, I guess I have to go back just a little bit. So this would be the number one cylinder. So it fires one, three, five, seven, nine, two, four, six, eight. And starts again. Oh, there's a pause button? Thank God. Okay. Yeah. I'm looking. I made it this one. It's usually the top. <laughs> okay, so if we did that, uh, it fired every time to be 40, but it wouldn't. So it'd be what, every 80 degrees? Because you have to go 720, so it'd be 720 divided by 9, right? So that'd be every, uh, what did I say, 40? 80 degrees. So every 80 degrees of crankshaft rotation, you would fire 80 degrees, 80 degrees, 80, 80, 80, 80, right? Yeah. Or thereabouts. So that would work if it was a perfect circle and they actually did fire, but they don't. They kind of, they're, they're off by a degree or two because of the way that articulating rod goes. So if you just built a standard magneto and you just had a regular old cam and you just turn it around like this one, because you know, if you put enough, enough holes in the distributor cap, you could make it work in theory, and you could use a two pole Rotor, if you had a two-pole rotor, then you'd have how many cam lobes on the cam? Two. 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 And so that, in theory, would work, except we get to the point where then some cylinders, it's going to be a little bit late firing, some be a little bit advanced. And if you know anything about a pilot, is that it, once your pilot gets a gauge in the, in the aircraft, everything has to match, even if it doesn't supposed to. So the CHTs, DGTs wouldn't match, and then we'd have all kinds of problems. I once had a, a client who had a nearly brand new Baron. It was gorgeous. And he insisted that every gauge from the right engine to the left engine did the exact same thing and the handles and everything in the exact same position. And you know what you tell a customer like that? Find a new mechanic. Yes, sir. <laughs> it's going to be expensive. <laughs> I spent a, a lot of time on that engine, and you can do it. It's just, I mean, it is down to, that's, and that's how I really learned how to set up fuel flows, exact, and what parameters I could, but yeah, it was pretty cool, and so, you know, you can do it, but I think it took me a whole week of just tuning engines, and, you know, if you listen to Anybody else, you know, like the, the AOPA podcast and stuff, those are flat tell you it's impossible. And it nearly is. It nearly is. I, you know, probably as soon as I got those gauges all lined up and, and we told them the whole time, it's just they're different engines. They do different things. That one's got an air conditioner. This one doesn't. That one's over there. This one's over here. You know, all kinds of things. He finally kind of bought into it, but we still had it very, very close. Um, yeah, I just had uh, uh, my 150. This is almost the embarrassing part. Um, I put a four probe CHT EGT in 150, which is really overkill, but I was curious. I wanted to know, you know, I want to see, watch, it's, it's, it's mostly about, you know, kind of 
the teacher in me kind of wanted to watch stuff, you know, and be able to talk about it more. So I did it. And I sold it. He called me yesterday. I was like, hey, you know, one CHT is just a little bit hotter than the other. And I said, oh, yeah, it's probably the number three because it has a pipe that's curved and I couldn't get the EGT in the exact same spot. It's off by like one eighth of an inch. He goes, it is. I'm like, well, that's why it's a little hotter. It's off by an eighth of an inch. It's just a little bit higher. That one. So, so you just have to kind of get around that. But you're flying an airplane that you know never sees the likes of 6,000 feet. So <laughs> it's not a big deal. Uh, okay. Compensated cam. There was maybe a point to that story, but who knows what it was. Um, so anyway, so you got to have a compensated cam. There we go. Compensated cam, 11, 12. What kind of notes are right? So. And again, how much voltage is in the magnetic Yeah. So, in, so compensated cam, you're going to find it in radial engines. So we'll put this used in radial engines. Engines, uh, because um, because of the way the master and link rods operate, uh, the path is elliptical. I don't know the path. Elliptical, I could say cylinders do not fire, do not fire at exactly the same degrees, same number of degrees. Does, does that work for you? Same number of degrees. There we go. So to compensate, So yeah, if we used a typical, if we used a symmetrical cam, mm -hmm. it would be off. So we can say that, and then three. So um, to correct, correct for the uneven timing, uneven timing, we use a compensated cam. I think this is a lot of information for one Q&A question. A compensated cam, compensated cam has the lobes properly spaced with the number one cylinder lobe clearly marked. The compensated cam has the cam lobes. Oops, what the hell was I going to spell? Lobes. Properly spaced with the number one cylinders, cylinder clearly marked. Nope, how about just marked? Because <laughs> it's aircraft, you probably have to look for a little dot. So if I had a nine cylinder radial engine, how many cam lobes would I have? One? 14? 18? It's nine cylinder radial, so there's nine cylinders. Four. I hear that, yes. But you shouldn't, you shouldn't be, you should think it through. So you have a nine cylinder radial, and each one of those nine cylinders sort of has its own independent time when it's going to time. 18. So some are going to be a little ahead, some are a little behind of what it should be. So like I said, every, so the way it goes, um, <coughs> let me think. So from pilot's point of view, it's going to go this way. So yeah, the number one, and then the next one to fire is going to be the three. three. Okay, so that's about, what I say, 80 degrees? It should be exactly 80 degrees. But maybe it's not. Maybe that one has got a is off by so 
should be top dead center. If this one goes top dead center exactly 80 degrees later, that one should be top dead center. But it's not. It's off a little bit. It's like 81 degrees. I'm making it up. And then you go down to the next one would be 5, and it should be at uh, 80 plus 80, so 160. But it's not. Maybe it's behind a little bit. It's 158. So if you have this, this mismatch of timing, then you have to adjust your spark. Otherwise, this one is firing at 25 degrees where it's supposed to. This one's at 27. This one's over here at, at 24. It's just a, it's a mess. So the cam has to be compensated. In other words, it has the cam lobes on the magneto. Some of them are a little ahead and some of them are a little behind to match what's going on in the engine. They had to figure that all out. So if you have nine independent cylinders doing nine independent things, how many different cam lobes would you have to have to make it work? Nine. 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 <laughs> Hopefully you see that. Because each one is individually spaced and thought out. It's not symmetrical around the, the uh, cam lobe either. So if we had that situation going, now you have another problem and that you can't just run it off of here necessarily because this, the uh, rotor is turning at a completely different speed based upon how many um, poles you have in there. So you really have to run this cam off of the cam on the engine. So it becomes kind of a, a big deal. Yeah. How big are the Not that big. Yeah. Inch across or so. Yeah. So, all right. Um, we'll put this. The key, the um, breaker cam. Breaker cam must be driven. D R I V E N at one half crank speed. What else would turn at one half the crankshaft speed in an engine? Camshaft, except, I'm looking, I'm looking. What's wrong with that theory? Radial engines don't have camshafts. Camshafts are shafts with the lobes and the lobes and the lobes and the lobes and a radial engine has all the cylinders right there. So they have cam rings, which have their own unique mathematical equation for how they go around because wow. the lobes kind of go and they hit this cylinder, then that cylinder, then that cylinder, and they kind of go around at a different thing and you have different tracks for them. You have the forward track, the aft track. So they are, let me see. Yeah, it doesn't have a cam in there. I think this one. Nah, we don't need to build it. Yeah. What? Okay. I uh, was a wooden one. Okay, we don't need to belabor that one too much. Um, okay. Firing order of a magneto. I have no idea what number I'm on, so we'll just make that a big circle. Firing order. Nope, of a magneto. Nope, I told you everything I'm gonna tell you about a compensating cam. What is the firing order? It's always one, two, three, four, on and on and on. It's the firing order of the magneto. The number one, cylinder position is usually clearly marked. And by usually, I should have said always. And then I wrote this, but I'm not going to write it. Technically, any position could be number one as long as the magneto is wired correctly to the other cylinder, but don't do that. All right, so... I want to look at this. When you are working with magnetos and you want to install it on the engine, remember the four-step process for installing a magneto on the engine. Step one. Set it to top dead center. No. Oh. <laughs> Somebody besides him now. <laughs> Step one. 
But that's cylinder one, the top dead center. He just said that, and I no, said no. I said somebody else. So I thought he was right. <laughs> He'll say the same thing he said. Come on, Harry. Set the number one cylinder where it's ready to fire. Yes, put the number one cylinder where it is ready to fire, which is before top dead center, according to the manufacturer. So I'm going to take the engine, turn the propeller, I'm going to bring the piston up before top dead center, because that's where they fire. Right? Number two. Put the magneto where it's supposed to fire to go to the engine that is also ready to fire. Does that, uh, hopefully, uh, does sense. that make sense? Yeah. It's supposed to. So if it doesn't, that's on you because that did make sense to me. So you put the engine where it's, right there is where it should fire. Then you put this thing right, right there is where you should fire the engine. And then you put the two together and bolt it down. And then find adjustment. But even if you didn't, you put it together. Well, I just put this where it's supposed to fire, and I put the engine where it's supposed to fire, and I bolt it together, and now when I turn it really fast, guess what this will do? Fire when that fired, and it's supposed to be right, and it'll follow the right sequence. Well, where to put the engine is a whole other thing, but where do you put the magneto for that position to fire? And Bendix are kind of nice and kind of not so nice. They have that little window right about here, there's, and you painted a red tooth with a little chamfer on it. So you had a red tooth and you had a red dot. The red dot's for when you put it together. But now you have that red tooth. And when that red tooth shows up right in the middle of that window, that should be E-gap for number one cylinder ready to fire. So that would be this one right here. So I got the red tooth showing. I can look in there. I can actually see the finger pointing right at this tower. And the point should just be getting ready to open. So this is ready to fire the number one cylinder. So I put it, put it on there. Boom, ready to go. So that's how you do Bendix. Now the hard part about Bendix is it's new, the E-gap is where? About, about 10 degrees past neutral. Where does the magnet like to come to rest? Neutral. So it's 10 degrees off. So if I were to take this and actually put it, so this one doesn't have the gear in it, but look at it, turn it just so the gear is right in the window and let go, it's going to go back 10 degrees every time. So it's off. Now, a smart person would put it in so that you have it with the studs on the one side and it's rotated a little bit. Okay, so that's what you do. A not so smart person came up with a not so good idea. Just put it back 10 degrees. Then Let's see here. All right, Bendix mag, that's what they actually look like. So there's that tooth right there, and you can see it right there, but you can see that's not quite in the middle of the window. It's off to one side a little bit because that's sitting in the neutral, it's, um, it's setting in the neutral spot right now, and then as soon as I bring it over to the middle, let go, it's gonna fall back that way. So right there is where the point should open. So if you could only find some way to hold it right there. So they came up with these tools. These tools look like they're made out of brass. steel, brass. And what it does is it screws into that hole right here and grabs onto that gear, which is made out of nylon. plastic and nylon or something like that, which is going to win. Well, so what happens is, I know mechanics, I use one. You have that little tool and it's holding just perfect, and you put the magneto in. And you're kind of fighting it because you've got to get the teeth to line up, and you're kind of moving it around. Well, now you're moving it back and forth, and it's trying to move that little gear back and forth is what it's really doing. Before you finally get it in, or you're maybe really careful. It's, oh, I got it perfect. I didn't do anything. And you bolt it down. Well, here always comes somebody of yours kind of leaning against the prop. What you doing, dude? All right, they move it just a little tiny bit. Oh, man, you moved a little bit. In our shop one time, we did a set of Magnetos for a Skymaster. You guys know what the Skymaster is? We have two outside. So how many engines do we have? Two. How many mags do we have? Four. We overhauled all four mags. Did a 500-hour overhaul. Um, and we sent them back. And the mechanic and not, you know, people would send us mags from all over the place. These just happened to come from Lodi, actually. So sent us all the mags. My mag guy, who was very, very good and meticulous about everything, he overhauled all four mags, 
sent them back to the mechanic Monday morning. He, we come in and it's one of those phone calls. Dude, your magnetos failed. Three out of four mags on this aircraft failed. The guy's lucky to be alive. He could barely make it. Skymaster's notorious for not doing well on one engine. So he's lucky to be alive. You almost killed him. Well, that about killed my mag guy. So being that they were in Lodi, you know, he said, bring him down right now. I want to see him. So the mechanic threw him in his car, drove up to us, opened him up. And guess what? Every single nylon gear had the little red tooth broke off. They were missing. So three out of the four were missing. And the fourth one was broken and sitting over. So what happened is he used one of those, broke off, broke off that tooth. And as it rotated around where the pinion gear grabbed that, it just started spinning. So mag just dies. The rotor keeps going, but the distributor stops. So that's why I say don't use those. I've almost seen people die from these things. Now, somebody does make a version of this that is rubber. That actually makes sense, right? But you don't need it. So I just say don't. No, look, that's aircraft spruce part number one, two. People still use them. Let me see. One, two. Idiots, dude. Is that an approved thing? Is that like in the manual? Oh, no, gosh, no, it's not in the manual. I'm surprised the manual doesn't say something. I thought it did, actually. Never under any circumstances use a holding device on the, the plastic. So, all right, so that's Bendix. Bendix is nice. They got that going. And, and you'll get more of this when you get into uh, 312, 313, but since we're on mags right now. <coughs> slick is a little different. No, slick is a whole lot different. They use a little timing pin. And so in order to figure out where I'm gonna put a slick to put it in the engine, it's kind of easier, kind of harder. So they give you three holes in the back. A left, a right, and an X. The left, the left, left, means for a left-hand rotating mag. When viewed from the? Drive hand. Drive hand. Actually, be any hand. It does not mean it goes on the left side of the airplane. What's the difference between, no, I shouldn't ask that. I will since I brought it up. What is the difference between the left-hand mag and the right-hand mag? On my airplane, not any, not a damn thing. They're exactly the same part number, the same everything. They're interchangeable. Right goes on the left, left goes on the right. It does not matter. Most Continentals are that way. Lycoming, what's the difference between the left and the right? Left usually has the impulse coupling. Right does not. So the big deal about that is the key is wired so that when you go to start, it's only working on the impulse left side. That but the, will that wear it out faster than, say, the right one? <laughs> no. no, but you have, I like Lycoming a little better than that. The fewer impulse couplings you have in your engine, the better off you are. These things will fail. So to get this into the right spot, you have the F, the L, and the R hole. In the distributor rotor, there are matching holes. So if I put it into the, I'll do the right up here. If I do the right, you move it around until it goes right in and sits in the shoulder. The thing you have to worry about, though, is if you're trying to, now you can do it this way, it's easy to see because I can see the back, but here I can't see the back, and I'm just trying to guess, and if you're doing this, you will break the magneto because eventually the little trailing finger is going to come along and grab it and try and bend it off. So you actually have to put it in and out while you're turning it, kind of feel, and then you get a couple of students who, because the left is at one spot and the right is just a little bit lower. So after a couple of mechanics have forced it in and made all the holes bigger, why this will stick into any hole. So that becomes a real problem. Anyway, so, so the L hole stands for what? Left hand. Yeah. And the R hole stands for? Right hand. And the X hole stands for? Uh, uh, it's Laser ignition. It's an electronic ignition system. It is. I'm not making that up. This you have to do, but. The laser ignition, okay. What else do I have in photos? There we go, we got that. I talked about, oh, this is what I'm talking about on this gear. This is just your super mechanic tip of the day. Sometimes when you're dealing with Bendix magnetos, 
slick, you don't have the problem because you have a whole lot of movement. As long as the little clamps go right here, you have a lot of movement, so you don't worry about it. But when you've got the Bendix mags, you have very limited movement where you can go back and forth. So you put the engine where you want it. You try and put this where you want it, even though it's going to go wander off a little bit. And you stick it on the studs, and then you rotate it, and you fine-tune it. And you're like, well, damn it. I don't have enough fine tuning because I put it in and it goes all this way and it hits the stud and it's still not timed right. So you take it out, try it all over again, do it again. Now it's hitting on this side. Dang it. You know, and it's like it, it just won't go. It's either too far this way or too far that way. So now you got a problem. And what, how do you fix that problem? Do it again. No, it literally won't. I mean, you can call the master mechanic, best guy in the world, and go, nope, there's, it, there's not enough room. I go, because this is how you adjust it, right? A little fine tuning back and forth. And the stud hits it on this side, so I take it off, move the gear one tooth, now it hits on this side, and I can't get it the other way. Huh? What is the problem? Well, now you'd be out of time. The engine's not where it's supposed to be. Oh. Wait. You use one of those. <laughs> They're gears. They go on the end of it. It makes it drive it. <laughs> I'm, hoping it I'm hoping you're using one of those. <laughs> it's right here. Okay, so you got the gear. The same thing. So I, I, I get it all lined up, I get it perfect. So you, you bring it in, you line it up like this way, and it's like, I, I don't have enough room that way. So you take it off, try it this way, put it on, now I got not enough room that way. So what I've seen some mechanics do is they take a Dremel tool and enlarge these right here. That sounds legit, huh? That's a way to do it. Yeah, that's the smart way. Here's your million dollar tip for the day. If you take a look at this gear going up and down, you will notice that this bar right here, if I looked at it, it comes right up and it goes right between these two teeth. And if I go look down at the bottom, it goes right at that tooth. If I take this gear and turn it 180 degrees, it's the same as turning it half a tooth. See? <laughs> so if you're ever... You may not understand that, but if you ever get in a situation where there's not enough room on a Bendix Magneto, take the gear off, rotate it at 180, and put it back on. Now, some of the manuals do tell you flat out exactly how to put it on. Some don't. I forget which ones tell you, which, which Bendix book told you, but it says something about how when you put it on, make sure that it's like in a certain position and that the gear is pointing in a certain way. So you do get it right to begin with, but it's an uh, obscure piece of information. All right, uh, we got that, talked about that. Ooh, we still have to talk about that, dang it, okay. Safety gap. All right, whose safety are we talking about? Everyone. Not yours. For the mags. For the mags. Some magnetos incorporate an internal gap that would give the secondary an alternate method to discharge the spark in the event of an open at the spark plug. Remember when I told you don't take a magneto and sit there and snap it constantly? Because yeah. it's got to discharge that spark somewhere, and if it can't, it's going to make a spot. It'll start carbon tracking inside the coil, ruining the coil. It'll blast outside the coil and find some ground to go to. It'll find the weakest spot it can and start working on it. So that's really bad. So some mags, and I've honestly... It's mini mags. I mean, I've worked on these mags. I've worked on radial engine magnetos or radial engine harnesses. And all this work, I've never really seen one go, oh, there's a safety gap. Would you look at that? Still an FA question. So some mags. Some mags. You can put magneto if you want. Incorporate. Incorporate an internal, internal gap. That would give the secondary yeah, that that will give the secondary secondary circuit yeah secondary circuit an alternate alternate path to ground if the spark plug is open. By open, I mean 
you don't have a spark plug, you don't have a, a lead, you got something going wrong, and that, that secondary spark, all that voltage can't find its way down the ignition lead to the spark plug and properly discharge safely to the magneto. It's got an alternate gap set up inside of the, ro the rotor and it will allow it to spark over there. Now, that's gonna be much bigger than the, the spark plug gap is, electrically speaking. Otherwise, it would just take that one. It's like, ah, I'm not going to the cylinder. I'll just go over here because it's easier. That would be bad. So, so it is bad. It is bad. Um, what do I want to say? Bad for the magneto to operate. Bad for the mag to operate without. Let me see. Without plugs. That's what I'll say. Without plugs. Plugs and wires and a path to ground. Coming in speed. Do I cover this already? Okay. Nope. Minus one. This is the Minimum, well, yeah, the minimum speed. No, I, okay, I could see where you could say maximum. It's, <laughs> let, me, let me just write it the way I was gonna write it. This is the speed at which, speed at which a magneto will consistently Fire all leads at a specified gap. Bendix is typically 150 RPM. So what happens if you're turning this Bendix Magneto at 151 RPM? That's how fast you got to go to fire them all consistently. Is it good or bad? Throw it in the trash. <laughs> no. <laughs> is 151 good or bad? No, bad. Bad. Is 149 good or bad? Good, but not quite that good. It's good, yeah. Good, but not that quite that good. All right. So the manual tells you it's got to be 150 RPM. Um... How do you know it's 150 RPM? Test. Test it. Well, the point I want to make here is anytime the manual gives you a number, the tool that you use to measure that number must be calibrated. Has to be. Huh? No. <laughs> but you're not returning it to service. So it's just for instructional use only. Uh, slick is 250. Now, these are general numbers. Uh, they could be a little bit different from one model to the next. So, slick is 250. Uh, did you ever tell you my, my FAA Magneto story? No. So, we had a, a we were a repair station, and we weren't when I first started there, but we became a repair station. So that was a good experience. I get to write through a manual and do all, go through the whole process. So uh, our repair station manual was both airframe and power plant, as well as accessories. And so we had the accessory shop, and the FAA, they would come down for their inspections. And, you know, and I, I've always liked the FAA. I was even around the FAA in the old days when they were the cops. And, and they're not the cops anymore. They don't want to be. It's public knowledge that they are educators they want to educate you to be safe and if you take their education you get along well it's when you don't want their education that they do turn into cops and i'm thankful that they do because we don't want unsafe people out there but from for the most part um the fa is a, a, a great bunch of people who really care and love aviation Mo 
aviation maintenance inspectors were all us at one time. You know, just like us. They just got to the point where they got hired by the FAA. They joined the other side. No. Um, so they're good guys. And, and so, and, and some of them have just this incredible wealth of knowledge they can bring with them too. And so if you're on their good side, you know, and, you, and you're one of the good guys and you, you know, we welcome to our shop. Come on down. Have a good time. So they came down. Anyway, long story short now. Too late. So they came down and it was, it, it was not that long. It was just a week or two before I was in the mag shop and, you know, we just transitioned from not being a repair station to being a repair station. So there's all these things that you kind of have to think through and like, oh, wait a minute. So, you know, um, Steve was our mag guy. So Steve was running a magneto and, and hey, Steve, you know. You're running the mag, it's gotta be 150. Is that tack on the, the thing right? Jeez, Kevin, I don't know, is it right? Well, how, we gotta figure it out. So, you know, Steve and I, you know, after work, we scratched our heads and something else and kinda came up, we tried all these different things. We came up with a plan that the, the coupling that would drive the magneto had something like this, but the opposite, had two holes going through it. So we figured out, we had a handheld tack checker and that uses optical impulses, so you can hold it up to propeller, and as the propeller spins, this will t take the optical impulses coming off the propeller, and you can check a tachometer with it. And so we thought, well, what if we got the handheld tack checker, and we held it on one side and put a light on the other? So yeah, good idea. So I don't know, maybe we tried a bulb, but uh, then we occurred to us that, wait a minute, bulbs actually flash. So that would be a, so we used flashlights, right, pure DC. And so we did it, and as this thing would go around, it actually worked, and we were able, I mean, we tried a little reflective tape, all kinds of stuff, but the ultimate, we got the flashlight on one side and the handheld track tucker on the other, and uh, it went around, and it worked really cool. And we were like, yeah, it worked, and we made this whole calibration card and posted it, and, and it wasn't that long before the FAA came down, and you know, in the first time, ah, is that thing calibrated? And I'm like, yeah, I'm glad you ask. You know, we're patting ourselves on the back, but you super geniuses that we are. So, they said, you know, well, how did you do it? And we explained it, you know, and, got the, and I showed him, show me that. And I showed him, he was kind of impressed. He goes, well, I handheld tack checker. Well, how'd you calibrate that? <laughs> well, just so happens the instructions say to hold it up to a fluorescent light and it will give you a certain number. I forget what it is, it's 300. 3, it's 36, 3600, yeah, 3600. <laughs> uh, but if you put it in the three blade, it gives you another number. So I forget what it is. But anyway, so you check it. And so there we go. He's like, that's very impressive. How did you calibrate the lights? <laughs> I said, oh, come on, man. That's the division of weights and measures and smuts problem. He laughed, of course. He goes, no, good job, guys. You know, it was kind of cool. So but I just thought that was funny. He just kept going. How do you know that? How do you know that? And then it was. Uh, okay, so let me see. Firing order. Got the mag firing order. Um, it's worth mentioning that magnetos get kind of warm. So. You have to think about cooling them sometimes. Now on the big bore Continentals, 470s and 520s and 550s, they put them up front. Well, not up front of the engine, but they, let me see. Oops, there's too many somethings there. We just need a picture. Picture will do this. There we go. That's a nice picture. It's a nice picture too. They sit right there. So here's where the propeller is going to go. So the air comes in through here and they're sitting up front. That's why I said they actually kind of sit backwards. So don't say from the pilot's point of view because these magnetos sit right actually looking right at the drive end. Uh, so Continental 470s, 520s, they're going to go there. All the other engines, they go back in the accessory case. Let me see if we can. Let me see. Engine. Stock engine was, let me see. What? Well, that'll take forever to find a picture. So, what's that? Oops. Which uh, way? Yes, I meant that. Uh, let's see. There we go. 
Oh, that's a dang, I just picked on an 0470 again. Oh, that's an old one. That would work. The old 470s, there we go. E-series. See, they put them right here on the back, which is very indicative of most engines. Very low res image. I know, sorry, I couldn't tell. But anyway, they go all the way in the back. And, boy, that is terrible for you guys. Yeah, so it gets nice and warm back there. And what I wanted to say is they just, so they use a thing called blast tubes. And, well, so they use blast tubes. We'll just put that. So they'll have little tubes that come out of the, the baffle. Baffle material is the tin that goes around the engine to kind of direct the airflow through. And so they'll put a little blast tube that goes down and points right at the magneto to try and keep it cool. So we'll just say that. So blast, they use blast tubes. Blast tubes. Use blast tubes. Um, all right, we have the dual mags. We already talked about that, but we'll. Dual magnetos. It's the Bendix. Bendix, now it's D3000 series. It was a 2000, but those were thrown out by an airworthiness directive. So they share. A common, common rotor and cam. So if they share a common rotor and cam, that means each one or each side has its own what? Definitely not cam low because if it's has one cam, can't give it each its own lobe. So okay, distributor. I see your harness. Harness. What else? Okay. Condenser, coil, points. Rotor. We get it all. We could even add pole shoes. I just wrote my notes: pole shoes, primary and secondary circuits, which covers everything. <coughs> so, but that was a little more. All right, break of time.